Good afternoon, Professor. Good afternoon, Amy. Thank you. Good afternoon. And good afternoon. Okay, here we go. And good afternoon. Wait, here we go. Good. Good afternoon, Amy. Good afternoon, Ice Cube. Good afternoon, Old Smile. Good afternoon, Orangaroo. Good afternoon, Jamalet. Good afternoon. Um, uh, oh my God, I just told uh, Jinx. Good afternoon, Steven from 2D. Good afternoon, Stone. Stone. Oh my God, what's he called? All right, sorry, I'm trying to do a thing and it's not working. Okay, but st Stone Stonejourner, right? Good afternoon, David. Good afternoon, Bianca. Good afternoon, Chloe. Good afternoon. Oh, 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 oh! I know this one. I know Cresselia. Good afternoon, Sophia. Good afternoon. This is so stupid that I'm doing this. This makes no, this is really dumb that I'm doing this, but I can't stop now that I've started, which is even dumber. Good afternoon, Stin. Oh, could I not? All right, I have to go back to sit. Oh my God. All right, this is so dumb. Um, oh, but there's two S's in a row. Sarah, okay, I need two. All right, I will think of them. Good afternoon. Oh, Soul Rock. And good afternoon. Oh, I do know this one. Oh, yes. Sir. If it's my tongue. All right, I owe an S. I'm going to keep going because this is so dumb that I'm doing this. Good afternoon, Diana. Good afternoon, Diana. Good, another S, oh, I can't do it. Good afternoon, Samuel. Good afternoon, Brianna. Good afternoon, Jasmine. Good afternoon, Jalen. Hi, Jada. Good afternoon, Brooke. Top of the afternoon, Abdel. So, oh my God, Amy, yes. I didn't even know if people knew. Okay, that just made my day. Oh, that after two, some, Amy, I'm opening up a portal just for Amy for that one. Okay, she totally nailed that. No, no, it's it, all the hair's there, but thank you, Jada. It's all there. It's just wet. Thank, but yes, it's it, listen to how it started for Jenny. All this time I was wondering if you yes, Amy. Oh my God. I think Amy just got extra. Yeah, it is a starter for Jenny. I mean, it's been around longer than that, hasn't it? But yeah, totally. Wait, Sobble, don't tell me. Sobble, Drizzile, and then Inteleon, I believe, is the evolutionary line. But yeah, oh, totally, Amy. Okay, sorry. This has become a little bit inside class here. Sorry. But okay, no, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. I'm sorry. I'm in a weird Well, first of all, look, I'm in a weird mood because you guys turned in your exams. So we're all relieved. We can all breathe out a minute or two here. Like, And I did want to compliment you and thank you all and congratulate you. Uh, oh, and, and and I will bring the board back in, but we are going to do physics, but let me back up. So yeah, so the silly thing I was just doing, and obviously Amy gets it, and it all kind of started with Amy, and it's no, it's just a thing, but I was trying to name a Pokemon that started with the letter of the alphabet that started with everybody's name, and then I like fell off with the S's, but then Amy named a Pokemon that began with S, which is a great Pokemon, and I should have known, and it's like totally a water type, well, at least in the card game, it's a water type, and whatever, um, um, I should have known it, and it's a great one, and it is a starter, yeah. Um, and obviously, not everybody in the world needs to care about Pokemon. You don't need to care about Pokemon to do well in physics, but it sure helps. Um, no, and so I'm just being silly. I'm being totally silly. Silly starts with S as well. Um, um, but I'm in a light, lighthearted mood, partly because I believe I checked right before you all signed up. I was a minute or two late. I was trying to fix my board, of course, but I, I do believe I can say with confidence, I, I really do believe. Okay, not everybody's here, and that's a little bit of an issue. It's true that some people are not here, and they're supposed to be here. But I can say that everybody who's in this room right now either has turned in their exam on time, and I'm very proud and happy for you and relieved for you, or, or you know, advance notice to me and made an arrangement and has a deal with me, where, which they're going to keep, and which if they don't, there are going to be consequences. Um, um, and again, just to repeat, and if one of you runs into a jam before the final exam, and if you reach out to me in advance, and we make an arrangement, and I'll even warn you right now with some people in some of the sections, I mean, the couple of people in every section did this, uh, whatever, 
And in some cases, just to be clear too, in some cases, because the person didn't give me very advanced warning or because I thought there was something a little bit dicey about what they're asking. In some cases, I said, I will only do this if you're willing to accept a six point deduction or something like that on your exam. So just so you know, like everybody's accounted for, no one's getting away with anything that like you, you who did turn in your exam did not or something. And it's just, it's a system that is strict, but with a compassionate safety net. And that safety net might be something you might need during your final, whatever. But I am saying, it's all to say that everybody who's in the room right now, either, I, like I can account for everybody who's in the room, either I know what their situation is and they communicated with me and they're being held to a strict standard or in almost every one of your cases, you turn in the exam and that's terrific. Now, anybody who's not in the room right now, that's a little bit dicey, I admit. Um, but well, but even they, frankly, I think, um, I think I know what's going on with them. But anyway, okay. So everybody's in, just about everybody's in the room now. And repeat, if you're in the room, that means you've either turned in your exam or I know what's going on with you and you've made an arrangement with me. So I appreciate that. So everybody should... Um, we're obviously not going to go over it now or anything like that, but, um, and I'll, okay, wait, okay. Anyway, we're going to go on with material in a minute, but if you're breathing out a little bit, that's great. Um, I hope, and I won't see you, I believe I will not see you Wednesday. You'll go on break, which you deserve and you should have, and you should have, um, and the only work you should be trying to do for physics over the break is anything that you still want to catch up from before or whatever's going on in your lab, but I'm not assigning anything more. So whether you do a religious observance or not, you should have some kind of, anyway. All right, so congratulations to all. But again, yes, Sahabal, I love Sahabal. Love Intellion. Um, the sniper. Um, uh, um, okay, okay, so let me get my board back. So we're gonna move on with the material, unless there's questions or anything. Um, let me get my board back going here. Oh, and, oh, and for those of you who asked, um, wait, remind me, I'm sorry. This is actually a real question. This section, you guys, oh, I think I know the answer to this. Are you the ones that have lot when, when, when and with, oh, top of the afternoon. Yes, top of the afternoon. Um, oh, I just gave away. Oh, sorry, I just broke anonymity, sorry. Um, who, to remind me again, you guys, all of you, when and with whom do you have lab? You don't have lab with Hemma Walter. Oh, you do. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. That's what I thought. That does make sense, of course. Okay, so just to be clear. Oh, and thank you for all the answers. I mean, thank you for Amy. Thank you, Ashley. Thank you, Amy, Ashley. Yes, and thank you, Sahabal. And thank you. You know who my favorite Pokemon though is really honestly, and they're coming out with an EX card for him in June, which I might make a whole deck out of because I love Copper Raja. I'm just saying for those of you who like enormous uh, Far Eastern elephants, I mean, native steel. I mean, who doesn't like that? Um, but um, um, God, I really didn't know how much your exam apparently stressed me out because I can't even think straight now. Uh, no, I hope it was a good experience for it. I, I, of course, it wasn't a good. I hope it was a learning experience. And I hope you feel okay about it. But um, what I was going to say, maybe this is what happens when I don't have my board. What I was going to say is, oh, that, that I will be there tomorrow. Um, you know, I usually am, but sometimes I'm not. I will be there tomorrow. Um, um, and I, may be, I think I'm going to be stopping by your lab for maybe a little while, in fact, tomorrow. Um, so, I, so I'll so i be able to say hello or goodbye to any of you uh, before you go on break, which is very nice. And then I won't see you on Wednesday, um, um, of course. <laughs> this is, we, should, we should have talked like this last semester. Maybe we did, maybe I wasn't listening, but that's great. I mean, I knew because, because like who has ice cube? I mean, that's so like, not obscure, but sophisticated. Anyway, um, yes, well, um, well, I'm bringing my decks. So, you know, if you have a moment, if you're in the middle of lab, I mean, I, you run, I mean, you finish early. Like, anyway, God, all right, sorry. See, I'm sure they have, remember folks, just forgive me. When I was growing up, we didn't have diagnoses for this kind of thing um, called my personality. Um, they just stuck us in right center field and expected us to fend for ourselves. Uh, I will see you tomorrow.
I may or may not be around. I'll see you tomorrow. I won't see you Wednesday. I'm, I'm going to start class. I don't know what I, I was about to make logistical announcements. I'll tell you right now, though, do, I do do holidays and stuff like that, and I will be traveling in the week. So I'm not promising. I, I hope to have your exams pack as fixed, quickly as possible, but some accidentally every single class end up turning exams in the same time. So I don't know what's going to happen with that. But anyway, we should. I should try to teach right now. Let, I'll just teach. This would be, if you want to try to get me off the topic today, I'm, as you can see, today would be, if you're exhausted, which you probably are, <laughs> It wouldn't be that hard to get me off the topic today. Oh, especially now because it's oh, it's the new month. So I oh no, okay, all right. I'm joining. I, I will stop. I will stop the madness. See, they should have like yabberbound trainers who go around and just like throw balls and try to catch my personality before it goes off the rails, and then like put me in their pocket with like a revive a max revive or something and okay right oh my god my board apparently whatever psychological ailment i have is apparently contagious because my board just caught it hold on a second connection failed pardon me hold on and i really would like to teach today i know it seems like i or at least i'm committed to the idea of teaching but why does my board my board feels spiritually disconnected. It's like it's like looking for the divine presence, but it doesn't understand that the divine presence is always looking for it. I have a Wi-Fi connection. Hello. Do you ever find that when electronic devices don't work, that talking to yourself really improves the situation? Yeah, neither do I. Join. Connection failed. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. Hold on. This is actually weird. Uh, okay. This is what I was trying to fix right before you, but I assumed that I was just being spaz and that it would and I am just being a spaz, but oh. okay. Connection fit what? Uh, all right. I oh, so here. okay. All joking aside, I'm gonna reboot my board because this is a this is it's always funky my board. And obviously, if there's any questions at all or any emergencies or anything about the exam or something, obviously put it in the chat. I mean, I know I'm joking around a lot, but I am actually trying to run a class. I promise. Um. Connection. When it says connect, why am I asking? You? I'm going to reboot my board because I'm. And in a minute, I'm just going to start anyway. Honestly, there is material I would like to do. I will just start talking about it and asking you to take notes in a minute if need. But I don't know that that really works so well for everybody. I don't know if any of this works so well for anybody. Can't refresh. I have no internet, but I have an internet. You're talking. Wait, not to be weird, but I mean, since Amy's last response, you can hear me, right? Like we're live. Like my internet's working, right? Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. I like the yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, John. All right. So why does my board not think it has? Any All right. I'm rebooting the board. I'm going to start talking. Um, unless anybody can quickly think of the burning question that you wanted to ask me all semester about God knows what um, about Gen eight. Wait, Gen 8, Gen 8, that's Galar, 
right? Jenny, I'm sorry, but that's Kalar, right? Saba was injured, was the starter. And I guess, God, I, and I'm going to take yes to mean that you hear me now. Um, I mean, that's like sword and shield, Jenny, right? Okay, well, anyway, um, uh, um, the board is rebooting. Here's what we're going to, I'm going to start talking out, uh, uh, unless you can find a better thing for me to talk about. The, the, The wave equation is, we're gonna move on in a big way to a totally new topic in like right after break, but there's like one big last uh, punchline or last subtopic of waves that I want to nail down before we go on break or before. Like I've made a big deal, as you know, I've made a big deal that a wave is an unthingy thing. Wave motion is unthingy motion. That's the real point in this course. Everything else we talk about for the, until the final game is all unthingy in one way or another. We had to spend all the first semester, half of the semester, building up all this harmonic oscillation stuff so that we, in effect, could create unthingy motion, if you know what I mean. Okay. And if you don't like the non technical terms, and when I say unthingy, I mean immaterial, right? I'm saying we had to study a very particular type of material motion so that we could ultimately understand how a bunch of material motions get put together in order to create an immaterial motion. I mean, that's really what I'm saying or have been saying. And the technical words for that are the more scientific words that you'll hear, you know, in future classes and stuff is that, again, is that all of physics 203 and kind of the first half of physics 204 were all about the trajectories of particles, right? Everything we had been studying was the particles moving through space and time. And from here on in, what we're talking about is either waves or very soon fields or very soon electrical current or possibly already in your lab, electrical currents or radiation moving through space and time. Like that's really, which is really the purpose of this course is like waves, fields, currents, and radiation moving through space and time. And all of those things are not made of material. Hopefully you are seeing what I'm saying when I say that every time now. Currents are ultimately not made of material. Fields are not made of material. Waves are not made of material. And then you might say, well, a water wave is made of material, right? It's like made of water, right? And I'd say, no, a water wave is not made of water any more than a sound wave is made of air. You need air for a sound wave to travel and you need water for ripples to travel through the water. But the waves themselves, the ripples are something other than water. Just because you have water doesn't mean you have ripples. And just because you have ripples doesn't mean you have water, if you know what I'm saying. And hopefully more and more, you do know what I'm saying. Now, and again, I'm, the board's coming back on. I'm not just babbling here, but I'm just trying to refresh this where we are. I'm really trying to make a point for the rest of your life, as science gets more abstract, particularly let's say P chem, which is abstract. I mean, I love it, but it's, it's abstract. Um, the more, you, it's always good, just like it's really good in science to be aware of the difference between a double equal sign and a triple equal sign. When you're dealing with inequality, it, it really helps to know which type you're dealing with and you analyze them and you solve problems differently. Once you know, oh, this is equal by discovery. Oh, wait, this is just equal by definition. Totally put you on a different path either way. Same thing in science from now, when you're talking about something, whether it's the Schrodinger equation in PCHEM or, or, or whatever, it's really good to know, are you, or, or spectroscopy and all these instruments that you use at your higher levels in, you know, in criminalistics, in, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, micro, um, uh, uh, molecular biology and in toxicology like it's really important at any given moment to be knowing am i talking about a thing moving from here to there or am i talking about like a pulse moving from here to there and it never gets spelled out once people are talking about pulses or currents or fields they they stop stopping to clarify that that's what they're talking about they get so used to it that it really leaves the rest of us in the dust if we're not perpetually aware that sometimes in science, we're talking about actual matter moving from here to there. And sometimes we are not talking about matter, material particles moving from here to there. We're talking about something else, but we'll talk about it as though we're talking about matter. So remember the word pulse is the word that we use when we're talking about a bit of a wave as though it were a thing. 
when we're tracking a crest with our eye as it travels from here to there, we'll talk about the pulse being over here or being over there as though it's a tennis ball because that makes our language and our math and our minds like puts us more at ease to be able to use the same physics language. But a pulse, please remember from here on in, is the word we use for a non-material item entity traveling through space and time. And similarly, the word that we use from now on when a pulse is moving from here to there, like, 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 like the crest of a water wave or a bit of sound moving from my mouth to your ear, when we talk about a pulse moving from now on, we don't actually usually say it moves or it travels, we say it propagates. The best sit, and I hope you're sort of trying to take notes on my babbling right now as I wait for the board, but but propagate is means motion, but it's the word we use when we're talking about immaterial things moving. And to propagate, I think the best synonym for it really is flow. Pulse, baseballs travel, planets travel, electrons travel, pulses flow. Electrical current flows. To flow is to move continuously in the manner of a stream or something like that, um, and and so forth. So so that's what we're so anything we're talking about from here on in in the, in the in the class is about the propagation of pulses. Uh, ultimately, what is a pulse? I think, in my view of the world, you could say it's a little bit of energy, but I think the best thing to say it's a little bit of information. We are talking about the flow of information from here on out. And the specific version of, of that is still waves. I've like, so I've like one last little subtopic phenomenon related to waves to put at your feet. And then we're, then we're gonna move on and all the rest of it is about electrical and magnetic fields and currents and all of that. But let me just see if my board now works. Let's just see. And if not, I don't know. Okay, looks better. Okay, for some reason. And have we been recording? Have we been recording all that crap? That's too bad. But okay. Okay, here we go. Okay. Okay, only wasted how much of your life? Oh, I don't even want to know. 25 minutes. Okay. Um, so here's where we are going. Okay. Um, oh.
Hello, hello. No cookies for dogs. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. This is what we're going to assume. I'm giving you a lot of information here all in one spazzy package. Okay. What we're about to talk about for this class and possibly one more class is the Doppler effect. Um, you're all familiar with the Doppler effect. I will give you an a rigorous definition of the Doppler effect in a moment. Um, but the non-rigorous reminder of what the Doppler effect is from your daily lives, the Doppler effect is, eh, right? It's that thing, it's that situation where like a motorcycle is passing you in the streets of New York City or a car or something. And as it's approaching you, you hear one pitch from the sound of the horn that it's blaring or the whatever. Um, and then as after it passes you and it's going away from you, you hear a different pitch. Okay, so it is that, it is this, Phenomenon of eh, right now. I have to, of course, I have to more carefully explain to you exactly what's going on with the Doppler effect and why and all that. And what we have to do is the math of the Doppler effect. But the shorthand version of the Doppler effect, which again, I'm trying to emphasize, is a very real phenomenon and a, and a phenomenon that a phenomenon that um is uh it, it, entirely intrinsic to wave motion. Like the Doppler effect is not something you experience when particles move. It's something we experience when waves move. And it's something we experience when waves move due to the relativistic or relational character of velocity itself. The Doppler effect is something that occurs when the relativity of velocity gets applied to wave motion or to the velocity of a wave. Okay, I'm going to explain all of that. Um, But when you but when you experience the Doppler effect, what you experience? Should I write this down? Yeah. All right. I'm gonna. I'll just write a quick definition. Ah, it just happened again. Sorry, that was so frustrating. Okay, I'm going all over the place with this. The Doppler effect ultimately is, eh. okay, but what is it really, right? Well, the Doppler effect is an effect that occurs when a, a certain condition is met. The condition for the Doppler effect is written in brown at the bottom of this screen. The condition for the Doppler effect the, is, that there's a wave traveling and the source of the wave is not in the same frame of reference, is not traveling at the same velocity as the receiver for the wave. More specifically, that the source of the wave and the receiver of the wave have different velocities relative to the medium for the wave. When 
So when either the source of a wave or the media or the receiver for a wave is not in the same frame of reference as the medium for that wave, when either the source of a wave or the receiver of a wave are have a different velocity from the medium for that wave, then the Doppler effect occurs. I'm gonna just say that one more time and then I'm gonna say what the Doppler effect is. But I mean, obviously you could say it in different ways, but the condition that is required to bring rise to the Doppler effect is that either the source of a wave or the receiver of a wave is not at rest, is not stationary compared to the medium for that wave. Right. Let's say, for example, we're talking about a sound wave. Okay. Let's say we're talking about a sound wave. Then what we're saying is, and let's talk, let's say we're talking about sound moving through air. Then if either the source of this sound, if either the speaker is moving through the air or the receiver is moving through the air, or for that matter, if the air is moving like wind is moving relative to the source of the receiver, if there's any motion between the air and either the receiver or the source, then we get a Doppler effect. Now, what is a Doppler effect? I'm going to go back to this page in a minute, but I'm just going to flip the page for a second. Okay, so I'm going to say again now, I'm going to emphasize again, this sort of puts it in one package. The condition is that the, the source and the receiver have two different velocities relative to the medium for that wave. The effect is that the source and the receiver will measure two different frequencies for that wave. And, and neither of them will be right or wrong. I mean, they'll both be right. They'll both be, they'll both be right. So when the receiver of a wave and the source of a wave disagree on frequencies due to a disagreement over their velocities, that's what the Doppler effect is. The greater the, it's what it says down here at the bottom, the frequency disagreement depends on, agree, on disagreement between velocities of source and receiver. So the greater the disagreement, and I don't mean disagreement like they're having an argument like in the UN or something. I mean, like literally discrepancy, I should say, between their measuring results. So if the source and the receiver measure two different velocities compared to the medium, then they will measure two different frequencies of the wave that one sent to the other. 
And uh, the bigger the disagreement between velocities, the bigger they will find a disagreement between frequencies. Oh, but it's not like, it's not a simple ratio, but, but that is the case. Um, let me, so we're gonna play this out as an example. We're gonna do the math, but let me also say one more thing. Okay, sort of sidebar, but important thing to know when talking about the Doppler effect, because I keep saying the Doppler effect, I keep saying the Doppler effect is eh. so the Doppler uh, so so the Doppler effect is a phenomenon that applies to waves in general, a very important phenomenon that applies only to waves, but to all waves. Now, sound is one particular example of a wave. In the case of sound waves, just bef before we go any further. The frequency of a sound wave is interpreted by the human brain, well, the ear, and then the human brain. It's interpreted as pitch or note or like high highness or lowness or like treble or bassness of a sound, um, not volume, not highness or lowness in that sense, but frequency of a sound wave is interpreted by us as note. So for example, it, and very specifically and very rigorously so, in fact, that's the meaning of frequency. This is part of what I mean when I say that when we send waves from one place to another, when I say we're sending information, this to begins to be an example of what I mean by that. If, 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 if I send vibrations through the air, if my um, uh, vocal cords vibrate at a, in such a way as to push this, the air molecules back and forth and back and forth 440 times per second, right? And then the next air molecules vibrate back and forth and back and forth at 440 cycles per second. And then the next one's the next one. And so if I start sending pulses or crests and troughs through the air molecules to your ear and, and they cycle from crest to trough, from crest to trough, 440 times per second. And then they there, then it hits your eardrum and your eardrum 
vibrates. And, and I'm not making, this is not a, a, a random or arbitrary example. I mean, specifically, if your eardrum then vibrates 440 cycles per second, which is known as 440 hertz, right? Then that sends an electrical signal through your brain, which vibrates or which goes back and forth and back and forth. We'll learn about that next in the class at 440 cycles per second. Ultimately, your brain hears that, interprets it, registers it as the A, like the note A that is found in the middle of a piano keyboard. I mean, obviously some of you are more familiar with that concept than others, but if you picture a piano keyboard, or if you know anything about notes at all, and you're, of course you're not required to in this class, but if you ever heard of like C, D, E, F, G, or like C, D sharp, you know, F sharp, G sharp, that kind of thing. Well, on a piano keyboard, if you could picture, I'm just curious actually, just to get, could you just put, can you just raise your electronic hand? If, if, if you were looking at a keyboard, if you could point out on the keyboard, what, just by recognizing like what white um, key was actually, a C or a D or an A. I'm just curious. Could you just raise your electronic hand if you would know a C when you saw one on a piano keyboard? One, oh, and it's Amy. She's like two for two. Just Amy? Only the Pokemon play? All right, from now on, Pokemon and piano is required for this class. Wait, no, but seriously, is Amy on? I'm not trying to say, is Amy the only one that could recognize notes on a piano? Well, raise your hand if you could recognize notes on any instrument at all. I'm just using piano as a standard, like Western example, but wait, do none of you know? Whoa, really? Wait, okay, Sarah, okay. Hold on, wait, wait a minute, Jasmine, okay, thank you. Sophia, okay, that, and, and all the key. No, okay, and that's honest. No, I'm not expecting that, it's not a requirement. And yes, they do all look the same until they don't. I mean, they do until you know where they are relative to the black keys and stuff, sure. Um, I guess what I'm, okay, let me put this a different, just for perspective. If you know what I mean by C or D or E from any context of music, whether from singing, from any instrument that you've, or just from, like, if you kind of know what I'm talking about when I say that D is higher than C or E is higher than E, I, I mean, whatever I just said, it's still not that many people. Okay, wait, raise your hand if you hear me talking right now. Raise your hand if you hear me talking right now. By the way, that's very cool, Sarah, that, that does that. Okay, you hear me talk. Okay, that's a lot more people. Okay, okay. Raise your hand if you listen to music at all, like any kind of music. I mean, hip hop, like whatever. Raise your, oh, that, now I got class. Okay, so you, oh, okay, that's cool. Okay, so you do know what I mean if I just say like higher or lower, right? Like, you know the difference between this, right? I mean, right, okay, okay. Okay, well, for what it's worth, like, cool, thank you. I'm glad we're all together in the yellow submarine, so to speak. Um, But like, oh, oh, okay, no, that's fair. Okay, I see the direct chat. There's one person direct. Okay, and that's fair. The key, keys look the same on the piano and you know the notes, but you don't know how to recognize an instrument. Totally fair. And I'm not saying that you should, like it just makes it easy. Fair enough. Well, for what it's worth, and thank you. Oh, and I don't know if Amy has, okay. But, but from now on, like if I'm sick, Amy's taking over the clip. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, um, well, all I'm trying to say is this. Like if you even, if you listen to enough music, if you listen to enough music, even if you don't consider yourself musical or whatever, but if you listen to enough music, and you have like a favorite band or favorite, like what, you know, and I know whatever, if you listen to music at all or go to concert or anything, if you know the songs that you know well enough to know when somebody screws them up, right? And I'm not being sarcastic. Like if you were to listen to a live performance and you were to know if your favorite artist or whatever, like hit the wrong note, or like you're at a party and someone else is like singing karaoke. Or people probably don't do that anymore, but whatever. If someone's like singing a song that you know, but you know something was off, like they hit the note too low, too flat, or they went too sharp. Like, even if you don't know any of the language for that, and even if you know you couldn't have done any better or anything, but you just know they did it wrong, like, then, then that's all you need. Then you know what I'm talking about. Like, right, if you know that a note is supposed to be a certain note, and even if you couldn't describe it, you just know it, and then someone's trying to sing it, and then they go too flat, like it's too low, like this was, right? And you're like, ooh, ah, I wish someone else were singing right now, right? That's just right there evidence, like that your brain knows the difference between one like pitch and another, even if it doesn't know names for them, right? And what I want to say to you right now, before I go any further is that's math. You may not be doing the math, but like the A in the middle of a piano keyboard, the note that happens to be A, like whether you call it that or not, 
but like the note that is A, what that is, what your brain, when your brain recognize, or if you recognize when a piano's out of tune, right? What your brain is recognizing when someone properly hits an A at the right time is your brain is recognizing 440 cycles, vibrations per second. Maybe you've heard this in sixth grade. Maybe you haven't. I don't know. And if you recognize, and the reason I'm saying middle A, that might even throw some of you off. Like, why is he talking about A? Well, because actually that's the note that's used in Western music since like the 1600s for us to like, that's what we tune to actually. I mean, I know that's not how they tune at the beginning of a, but that's, the point is A is the standard. The fact we define everything around the idea that an A, the middle A is 440 cycles per second. That's not a made up number. That is the number. Or similarly, if you're more familiar with this, the C, a couple of notes down on a piano, like if you go over one and over, I mean, uh, I mean, if you go over a couple, like over to G and then at the D over to C, the C that's in the middle of a piano, like it starts like Mary had a little lamb or do, re, mi, fa, whatever, that C is 256 cycles per second. Like that's what it is. If a piano is out of tune or a guitar is out of tune or anything that, but it's like close, but it's wrong. That means that it's vibrating at some number per second that's close to 256, but not close enough. Like a note is a number, is what I'm saying. And, and it's all very mathematical. Again, some of you, especially if you're trained in all music, you may have been hearing this for years in your life, but some of you may have no idea what I'm talking about. But if you can at all picture that like a note is a particular number of vibrations, then I, it goes much further than that. Like, like if you go, if you hit the middle C on a piano, you're, you're making air vibrate at 256 cycles per second. If you go up what's called an octave, if you go up to the next C, okay, like you go do, re, mi, fa, sol, ti, do to the next do, if you go C, D, E, F, G, and you put your finger on a few, you know, like eight keys away or 12 pitches away, whatever, and you go to the next C, an octave up, like you might even be wondering why do they call that? Like that's a different note, it's higher, but they call it C again. What's like the similarity between that C and the other C? Why are they both called C? If they if they're not the same note, the reason is that next C is 512 hertz. It's an integer multiple up of 256. Like I'm not kidding. And if you went down the other way, it's half of 256. Like all the notes. The octaves are integer multiples of the original notes. And it, it goes on and on like that. When you're hearing notes, you're hearing numbers. Your brain, what, what's right or wrong about the pitches is what's right or wrong about the number of cycles per second that is hitting your brain, specifically frequency. Frequency is the information that is being sent to your brain. And when I say that, now I'm talking to everybody in the room here. Like, I just get, like, really appreciate that for a minute. It's actually wild. I mean, I'm saying like, like for a note, even just one note, let alone a chord or a bunch of overtones or a bunch of people singing together or a bunch of instruments and singing, but just for me to send one little pitch to your ears, if we were in the same classroom together right now, like not even worrying about the internet, like First, my vocal cords have to vibrate at a certain frequency. Then the air molecules have to vibrate at that same frequency. Then the wave hits your ear drum, and now your ear drum is vibrating at that frequency. I'm saying if you think, and then, then to your brain, to electrical signals, I'm saying for one little note to go all the way from my mouth to your brain and land as a note, right or wrong. And again, all of you, if you ever listen to music, you all know the difference between right or wrong. If someone gets it wrong enough, I, and some of you have perfect pitch probably in the class, but I mean, like, even if you don't, even if you don't think you know anything about music, if someone's wrong enough, you know it, right? You're like, oh, they don't know that song, right? What's happening is a number is being, wait, let me back up, for, a wave is being sent from somewhere all the way to your brain. And that wave is passing through and probably at least four different media on the way to your brain, right? Again, like I keep saying, first it's vocal cords, then it's air molecules, then it's like eardrum cartilage, whatever that means. Then it's electrical um, 
charge. So you're having vibrations of different shapes pass through all these different media and all therefore at different speeds, because to get back to the point eventually, what we established last time is that for once a wave travels through a given medium, then it travels at a given and fixed and constant speed through that medium. And that's ultimately the point of all this. But through each of those media, all these things change. The speed changes, the material changes, the, the, the you know, like the omega and the K, all that stuff changes. But one thing remains constant through all these media. It's the frequency. The frequency is the information that gets preserved and remembered and cemented somehow through all these passages. And what ultimately lands on your brain, if the note A lands on your brain, what ultimately lands is the number 440 that somehow got preserved through all of these complex, intricate processes. Uh, to, first of all, that alone to me is fascinating. But to get back to the point, what I'm trying to say right now is that frequency of a sound wave is interpreted or experienced by human beings as pitch, just as some might say the frequency of a light wave is, is experienced as color. And we'll get to that, but okay. Um, when we say high and low from here on in, in this context, we're referring to frequency. If you want to think about volume, that's a different issue. I wrote on the side because I don't want to distract us, but just for perspective, the amplitude of a sound wave ultimately determines the energy of the sound wave, which ultimately determines the volume, how loud or soft we experience it. Okay, and so the farther away you are from sound, the more time the sound has to dissipate and, and the waves get sort of lower and lower in energy and lower and lower in amplitude. And then there'll be lower and lower in volume by the time they get to you, but that's volume. What I'm here to say right now, the thing we're here to discuss, even though I've been all over the map today, um, the thing we're here to discuss is the frequency of a sound wave, which gets interpreted by your brain as pitch. So the overview, of what I'm saying now, the whole idea of the Doppler effect. Let me just switch to the screen. The whole idea of the Doppler effect is, well, okay, I'll say it. The whole idea of the Doppler effect is that if the source of a wave is like running toward the receiver of a wave, or the source of a wave is running away, from the receiver, or the receiver is running toward the source, or the receiver is running away. If there's motion of either the source or the receiver relative to the medium for that wave, then what happens is the source and the wave, uh, the source and the receiver will disagree on the frequency of that wave. But let's get straight, and we want to run the numbers. That's what I'm trying to get to ultimately. This is running the numbers, but let's get this straight. We're talking about a frequency disagreement that is dependent on velocity. We are not talking about a volume disagreement that is dependent on position. I just want to get that out of the way before I go any further. That the whole idea of the Doppler effect is that the faster something is coming toward you, the, the faster some sound source is coming toward you, the higher pitch you'll hear that sound. The idea that the closer to you it is, the louder you'll hear it is also true, but that's not the Doppler effect. That does, that's not interesting, ultimately. I mean, it's interesting, but it's more self-evident. Um, so the Doppler effect has to do with frequencies and velocities, nothing else. Um, I, there's four possible basic cases of the Doppler effect. Case one, what I'm about to analyze right now, to the extent that we still have time, case one would be like the receive... Uh, don't worry about this. Yeah, you may want to write this down. I'm getting myself bogged down. But when I say there's four different cases of the Doppler effect, the four basic cases are receiver approaching, receiver receding, source approaching, or source receding. Like to recede is to go away. So I'm saying the four basic combinations are of, of something making a wave and sending it to something else, something transmitting a wave to a receiver, the four basic cases are this is happening, or this is happening, or this is happening, or this is happening. Okay, if any of those four things is if 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 any of those four things is happening, 
We, the source and the receiver will disagree on the frequency of that wave. They'll measure two different frequencies and they'll both be right. Just like they'll measure two different velocities and they'll both be right because that's the nature of velocity. So let me set, I'm at least gonna set this up for you. Um, here's case one that we're gonna do. Case one, I'll, I'll put in. Okay, case one, the receiver is approaching toward the source. So what, so, so on the left, I have a really stupid drawing of what's supposed to be sort of a speaker, like the classic icon for a speaker. And so it's making sound waves. So those dumb, so I hope you're following this. Now. I know I've been all over the map, but hopefully you're, we're, you're gonna see this diagram a bunch of times. I, we're probably gonna do this for one more class period because I've been all over. Anyway, it's got a speaker there creating sound waves. Then you've got this dude, this person who can hear, who uh, um, is a receiver of the sound. And he's got the stupid wind um, cartoon effects coming from him. The, the person is approaching, is running toward the source of sound, okay? Before going any further and giving you numbers and giving you data, I made with a red arrow and a plus, like, I hope this doesn't confuse you. I'm saying the person is running toward the speaker. The speaker is sitting still in the air, but I've made, I've um, labeled a coordinate system. I've made a red arrow with a plus sign, meaning the direction that the wave is traveling toward, the, the direction that the wave is traveling from the source to the receiver, I'm designating that as positive. That's my coordinate system. And that's my advice to you for all these Doppler effect problems. It, it's just a choice to designate whatever the wave is doing as positive. So any numbers associated with the wave will be positive and anything that goes against them, such as the receiver's motion will be negative. Okay, so I've labeled that. Now, I've given you a bunch of facts about the case. From here on in, I'm going to use the letter W to stand for wave. I'm going to use the letter M to stand for medium. I'm going to use the letter S to stand for source. I'm going to use the letter R to stand for receiver. Okay. And I'm going to remind you, I'm going to remind you that there's all. All this. Remember, Galileo's principle of relativity back from physics 203 is very important. It makes a plays a big, big role in this whole topic here. Remember that velocity is relative. All velocities are relations between pairs of objects. They are not properties of single objects. So, so to keep that straight, um, we use subscripts, we use pairs of subscripts after the letter V. So from now on, to remind you, we used to do this in physics 203. If I say VAB, what I mean is the velocity of A relative to B. What I mean by that is the velocity of A as measured in the frame of reference of B, the velocity of A according to B. What that specifically means is that object B is assuming itself to be at rest. Velocity B is, is treating itself regarding itself as stationary and, and watching A move by in some direction at some speed. It's like the video game first person perspective of B. That's what I mean by velocity A, B, okay? And, and remember from physics 203, you may, you may want to find your notes or whatever. Remember what we believe about that. When I say that we believe that velocity is relative, I, well, I mean everything about that. I, I mean the principle of relativity, specifically Galileo's principle of relativity, specifically form number four. Um, do I want to write this right now? Hold on, let me just let me talk. 
Yeah, uh, we're, I'm gonna I'm gonna add a page right now. Remember. Remember all this nightmare? Not really nightmares. In fact, I think this is even when in your class I read the story. Like this whole thing of like once we understand that the earth could be moving and yet not us not feel it at all is when we begin to understand that velocity is a matter of perspective, right? Velocity is a relationship of one object to another. It's not an intrinsic property of one object. So a way of notating that mathematically, that discovery, that recognition, that fundamental principle of how velocity works is to say if you have any two... If you have a bunch of objects, A, B, and C, and they all have different velocities, the velocity of A relative to itself, the velocity of A compared to itself, or the velocity of A in the frame of reference of A is always, by definition, zero, right? Like, in, like as in video games, I am never moving relative to myself. I can always see my own nose right in front of my face. And it's if it's one inch in front of my face, then it's always one inch in front of my face, right? I am not moving relative to myself ever. That's that's the one object case of relativity, right? Then the two object case is if I'm moving past you, if I see you moving at 30 miles an hour past me to the north, then you see me moving at 30 miles an hour past you to the south right? The velocity of A relative to B is always necessarily, by definition, the negative of the velocity of B relative to A. And both are correct, right? Like the, the sun rises in the east from the perspective of the earth. The earth rises in the west. Well, the sun moves from east to west relative to the earth. The earth moves from west to east relative to the sun, right? And they're both right. They're both right as right as each other. It's a matter of what perspective are you in? But then the, so that's the two object case of relativity. The three object case is the velocity of me, the velocity of me relative to a subway plus the velocity of a subway relative to, to Ninth Avenue, Eighth Avenue, is the velocity of me relative to Eighth Avenue, right? velocities add that way remember we did this whole that was like on your midterm yeah of philosophy of physics 203 so velocity is a relation between two objects and i'm going to use those subscripts to to keep that in mind with this doppler effect case so i'm going to say because uh, that like plays a crucial role in the doppler effect so here's the givens for this case one let's say the free well let's start with Let's start with this given up here. That the velocity of the wave relative to the medium, let's say, as a given in this case, is 340 meters per second. Now, that what is I what do I mean? I mean the velocity of the wave relative to the medium. In this particular case, I would mean the velocity of sound relative to air. And I'm saying it's 340 meters per second. That's not an arbitrary example. That actually is pretty much the accurate figure. Assuming air is at a standard temperature and pressure. Let me emphasize, again, since I'm sort of all over the place, this given in this problem, it can be a given precisely because of the last two lectures we did uh, last Wednesday and last Monday. That is what... Our big revelation last Wednesday from the wave equation 
which I also will write right now. Just to remember from last week, omega over k is the propagation speed of a wave. It's determined by omega and k, which are parameters of the medium. So just the big revelation of last week is that once you create a wave, such as sound, it will travel at a certain speed relative to that medium, regardless of what you try to do with it, regardless of even how fast you might be running or moving when you create that sound, the, the, uh, the, uh, a wave travels at one and only one speed relative to its medium and fixed at a as a constant by its medium. So that in this context of the, of the Doppler effect, that's what we mean by VWM. It's the, in this case, like the speed of sound relative to air, it's the number that's never gonna change and that everything is else is gonna work around, okay? Um, that's a given in this problem. Then let's also assume um, that what's given is that some note comes out of that speaker. So it says FWS, that means frequency of wave relative to source. Um, and it's given in this problem as 500 Hertz. That would be a little bit above a middle A, like an A sharp or maybe even a B. Um, then we're saying that the velocity of the source relative to the medium, VSM, equals zero meters per second. That means the source is sitting still in the air. Uh, like it might, I mean, it means it's sitting still relative to the air. It's, so the source is creating this note while it sits still in the air, and there's some dude running towards the source, maybe in a car, driving like really fast, at 40 meters per second into the air. So... Um, so the sound is traveling through air, the air is fixed relative to the source, and the receiver is moving through the air. If this scenario occurs, and obviously we're not gonna solve it today because I've been talking like an idiot, but. Okay, just to summarize, we're not going to solve this now, obviously, I've, but just to summarize and try to distill exactly what the situation is, I, in every Doppler effect problem, what's given is the frequency of some wave relative to the source, the frequency of the sound that's made by some speaker. What's also given is how fast that speaker is moving relative to the air, how fast the receiver is moving relative to the air. Usually one is moving at some speed and the other is moving at zero, but we don't. Um, and what's finally always given, the biggest given of all, is how fast that sound or that wave moves relative to the air. Those are the givens. And what we're always meant to solve in a Doppler effect problem is what is the frequency of the wave as measured by the receiver? 
the ultimate thing. And I'm saying in this case, it's going to be something other. I mean, no, in all cases, it's going to be something other than what the source measures. The thing in a Doppler effect, okay, I've got one minute. We're not going to do the math right now. I mean, obviously, class is about to be over and, and have a great break, or I'll see you tomorrow. Um, all Doppler effects are like, and I'm looking at the clock, I promise. All Doppler effects are like, if there are waves coming in at the beach at Coney Island and they're coming and they're sent out by some ship or something at one wave every second, right? If I'm standing at the beach, then they'll hit me at one wave every second. But if I were running toward the water, even if they were being sent out at one wave every second, if I were running toward them, I would encounter them more frequently than one every second. I wouldn't be misperceiving. I would, in reality, if I were running toward them, right? I they would be coming into me at one per second, but I'm coming into them. So I would encounter the waves at a frequency that would be higher than the one at which they were sent. And if I were running away, it would be lower. Same thing with sound. In this case, sound is coming out at 500 cycles per second, but the ear, the receiver is running toward the sound to meet it. So the receiver is going to experience a sound at something higher than 500 cycles per second, they're going to hear a note that's higher than the one that was played. That's a, all we have to do is do the math to figure out what that new note is. And that's called solving a Doppler effect problem. This would be case one. The other three other cases are three permutations on it. I know I've been all over the place today. I'm sorry. Um, but thank you for coming. Thank you for doing your test. Congratulations. Hopefully I'll see you in person tomorrow for a little while. Um, and then have a great break. Okay. Thank you. Thank much. you. Have a great day and thank see you tomorrow. You. Thank you, you too, Amy. Thank you. Solve forever. Woohoo. Thank you. Bye. Have a great day, Professor. You too. Thank you. And sorry for the mess, everybody. But thank you. Yes. Okay. My mess. I mean, okay. Okay. And David, are you okay? You're there? Are you? Shall I? Are you there? Shall I sign off? Going once, going twice. Hmm. Are we still there? Hello. This is interesting. Uh, okay, David, are you there? Going once, going twice. Hmm. Well, uh, okay. Uh, bye.